father and his two sons planned a guy's day out, going to a gun expo to shoot machine guns. Christopher Bazil, eight years old, 66 pounds, got his turn with a micro Uzi. But when the little guy pulled the trigger, the powerful weapon jerked and Christopher shot himself in the head. Charles Bazil watched the whole thing. His video camera captured the moments that shattered his life. Now the police chief who set up the expo is charged with Christopher's death. Jurors have to decide if Edward Flurry is guilty of involuntary manslaughter or if this is just an awful accident. This is Massachusetts versus Flurry, and it's on In Session. Welcome back to In Session. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us. And we are getting close to the end of Massachusetts versus Edward Flurry. Uh, closing arguments on taps uh, in the next couple of hours. We'll go through them. We'll take a listen and we'll try to figure all this out. In the meantime, uh, don't forget what this case ultimately is about and why everyone is in court. It's because an eight-year-old boy lost his life. That eight-year-old boy's name, Christopher Basile. There's nothing forced about those pictures. Those are, that's who they were. And um, they're best friends. And I know that Colin misses him every day. Lisa Wargo remembers the close connection her nephew, Christopher Basile, had with his brother, Colin. Lovingly known to his family as Whoopa, eight-year-old Christopher lost his life when he mishandled a weapon at a gun show. It's hard because it, you feel like you take a step forward and then you take a couple steps back every time you... You know, it's just, it's, you're raw. You're just raw again. But you want, I want to talk about him. I don't want people to forget about him. I don't want him to be just that headline, because he was more than that. Since Christopher's death, his mother, Suzanne, has been coping by focusing on the special bond she had with her son. Too emotional to appear on camera, Suzanne read a letter celebrating Christopher's life. We don't focus on how he passed, but what we have left for each of us is his smile, those long lashes, his hair, those cowlicks were his trademark, <laughs> his spirit and sense of adventure. Christopher's spirit made a big impact on his brother. Their aunt read a eulogy Colin wrote just three days after Christopher died. It says, Chris was an amazing little boy. He was always upbeat, joyful, and positive. He was so creative in what he did and with what he used. In his life, he touched a lot of people. He loved to ski, go boating, play at the beach, and more. All of what I just said are samples of what Whoopa liked and who he was. Christopher's love for the beach and the holidays is remembered at his final resting place. Chris loves snow globes, so there's always an abundance of snow globes on his grave and shells, he loved the beach. Um, so they go and they, you know, they bring wreaths and they have um, solar snow globes and lights because um, he didn't like the dark. So we always have those lit at night. And each year, Christopher's family dedicates a toy drive in his memory. He'll live on in our hearts and in our minds. We have wonderful memories. It's amazing how many memories you can have for such a short period of time, but they're there. A life cut way, way, way too short, and obviously that's what this trial is about. Should that police chief who put together this entire uh, gun show uh, be held responsible for that death? We'll get back to the closing arguments. In the meantime, uh, we're, we're going to have our own little arguments now. Joining me to, uh, this afternoon, John Rosenthal, founder of Stop Hand Gun Violence. Also with me, Larry Pratt, executive director of Gun Owners of America. Welcome to you both. Um, and what we're going to talk about here is firearms versus machine guns and safety concerns and kids and guns and everything else. Um, l let me begin and throw this out, first of all. Get your initial, and thank you both for joining us. Um, a child and a machine gun. I'd like to get from each one of you, when you first heard of this story, this scenario, what your initial reaction was. And John, I'll let you go first. Well, first of all, let me just say that I'm a gun owner. I believe in gun rights, and I'm trained and licensed, and uh, I just simply think that, that a ton of mistakes were made here. I think the jury got it right, um, because I don't think anything would have been helped by sending the police chief to jail. 
Um, but uh, there was a lot of bad judgment. Uh, an eight-year-old should not be accessing a semi-automatic or automatic weapon. I'm a firm believer that we should train our kids around safe storage and safe use of firearms. But no kid needs to access a machine gun. And uh, from the police chief advertising uh, that kids can shoot for free or shoot anything, that there's a certified instructor where there wasn't, uh, and then for a father to, uh, to allow his son to have access to that weapon is unconscionable. Um, so mistakes were made across the board. All avoidable, all simply avoidable by uh, not putting a machine gun in the hand of, a, of an eight-year-old. And I will say that today and every day, eight more kids will die from firearms. And half of those kids will die uh, who are zero to 15 years old simply accessing some irresponsible adult's firearm. The other half are 15 to 19 year olds, also shouldn't have access to guns. Um, but most of those deaths are, are avoidable if, if people stored their guns safely like I do, are trained like we require. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, eight parents bury their kids today and every day, and we don't have the gene to bury our kids. Yeah. Larry, you know, when I first heard uh, of, of what happened here, and, and I heard eight-year-old and machine gun, Uzi, I thought, how could that, you know, and, and obviously this case is all about whether or not that's legal, should be legal, isn't legal. But just that scenario, I just want you to think about that scenario. What was your reaction when you heard that there was an eight-year-old? at some gun expo, gun show, whatever you want to call it, shooting an Uzi? Well, the first question is, how could that happen? And in looking into it, I realized that the father had been warned by the rather proficient uh, teenager who was there as the range official at that particular point, said, I don't know that this is the right gun uh, for your son. This one kicks uh, pretty strong. And the father went ahead anyway. So. I think if we were to say anybody really had bad judgment, it would be the father. There were plenty of other kids at that range shooting safely. Uh, it was the wrong gun for that kid of that size, and the father made well, a let me ask you this, Larry. Judgment. Let me ask you this, Larry, because uh, you know, my reaction is a little different. I just think of kids and Uzis that I don't know if there's ever an appropriate time for those two to be mixed together. Do you think under, uh, under some circumstances, it's okay and it's proper and it's fine uh, for youngsters to be shooting Uzis. I well, mean, certainly. you got to be uh, 17, 18 year olds just to drive a car, uh, and then we've got you know young people here handling extremely dangerous weapons. Uh, in in that situation, there was plenty of supervision and there was a proper warning. Uh, that was given about that particular gun because the gun because it was so small had a particularly bad kick and it was a a good warning it was a bad judgment unhappily that was made by the father uh, but otherwise i think it was a fine thing for uh, that range to be doing uh, for that police chief to have organized it's a good thing for youngsters to get experience with firearms because that's the way they learn how to safely handle them all right, so let, let's, get, let's take the debate there now. Let's take the, the, the debate one step further. Uh, John, from your perspective, uh, when, at what, is, is there an age, you know, a bright line age? Is it, you, you know, up to parents to figure out how mature my child is? What do you think is the, the proper time to introduce uh, children to firearms? I think introducing children to long guns, rifles, and shotguns, uh, if they're supervised with their parent and hunting, uh, you know, that is a very smart thing. Uh, and frankly, the younger the better, as long as they're supervised. I, I frankly do not think that a child under 18 years old should ever have access to an Uzi or a machine gun. Um, these are weapons that really were banned uh, from 94 to 2004. Um, and there was a dramatic reduction in these assault weapons showing up in crimes. And these are the weapons that are really preferred by criminals and gang members. Uh, and law enforcement does not carry weapons that have that kind of capacity or power. So I don't think we should be making them available to the general public, never mind uh, children. I think once you're 18 years old, trained, licensed, 
you know, that's a whole different story. Uh, and this, this gun show, uh, like all gun shows, are really a loophole that are virtually, you know, un, unrestricted and unregulated. Um, for instance, you can go to one of 5,000 gun shows today in this country uh, and buy an Uzi or any other kind of high-powered weapon, handgun, long gun, or uh, semi-automatic weapon, cash and carry without even an ID or background check if you buy it from a private individual. Like Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, sold weapons at gun shows privately, no ID or background check required. That is the case for private gun sales in 32 states. So I'm a believer in the Second Amendment, but I do not believe that the founders thought the Second Amendment should extend to criminals, terrorists, and kids to buy anything undetected, including high-powered weapons, uh, cash and carry with no ID or supervision or training. Uh, Larry, do you see machine guns in a separate category from other firearms? Well, first of all, let's not blur the distinction between machine guns and semi-automatics. Machine guns were never affected by the gun ban that went from 1994 to 2004. Right. That was only semi-automatics. Uh, th the kind of gun that was used in this tragedy uh, has not been banned. Uh, it's heavily regulated and one cannot buy one of these guns at any gun show at any state in our country cash and carry. One must go through all kinds of paperwork, background checks, paying federal license fees and so forth. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's an uh, unfair characterization to imply that uh, the Uzi that was used in the Massachusetts episode uh, could be purchased cash and carry. Should there be a distinction between that, those guns and semi-automatics? No. They're covered by the Second Amendment to the Constitution. It's the kind of gun that the founders had in mind for the members of the, the public to be able to own. In fact, at the time of the founding of the Republic, the law said that a military rifle had to be owned by each and every free man uh, in the country, and he had to bring it. But not eight-year-old. Uh, it, it, well, it, it said between 17 and 44 was the militia age, but there was no prohibition on uh, who could own that firearm. It just said that Nor if you're between 17... Nor were the weapons 70, that shoot 20 rounds it, a second. It, it, no, and there was, there was no fast press and Internet either, but all of those are protected by the First Amendment, just as machine guns are protected by the Second Amendment. So ultimately, Larry, are there background checks required at all gun shows? Uh, no, uh, for most purchases, unhappily, yes. Uh, we don't have background checks to put out a newspaper, but unhappily, we do have it uh, in the are exercise of the Second Are there background checks for Amendment. private gun sales in 33 states and at thousands of gun shows? No, there are not. So and that there, involves there about to be uniformity. Two, that involves about 2% of the sales at the shows. All the rest are registered, and that means the government has access to them uh, on demand. Gentlemen, uh, it's an issue that will be uh, continue to be debated by the public and obviously comes up. Both sides very passionate about it. Appreciate your time. Larry Pratt, Executive Director, Gun Owners of America. John Rosenthal, founder of Stop Handgun Violence, co-founder of Common Sense about kids and guns. Appreciate your time today, gentlemen. Thanks so Thanks. much. My pleasure. Thank you.